Good afternoon and evening to everyone. I'm Sandra Hobson. I know I've met many of you before. I'm one of the spine surgeons here with Seattle Science Foundation's Young Surgeon Series. Uh, today we have two excellent featured presentations, one from Dr. Burleson and one from Dr. Donnelly. And today we're going to get started with Dr. Donnelly. He is a spine surgeon based in Texas with operations in Addison, Plano, and Frisco. And he is about to take it away. All right, Sandy, great. Appreciate it. Appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity. And John, thanks for inviting me to do this. I think it's ironic. I was just on the other panelists before I'm giving a talk about maximizing technology. And I have this beautiful background behind me, but with my backlit room, I can't figure out a way to show you both my face and the background. So if you take everything I say about adopting new technology, it's a grain of salt. But as um, they alluded to, so in Dallas, Texas, and just kind of a little background about me, about my practice. Um, let me advance. Ooh. Sorry, it looks like there's a little lag and got really excited, but you see where we're going with this. So some of the background about me is um, kind of grew up in the area of where I'm practicing now, uh, Dallas, Texas. And I did my residency at Miami, University of Miami, did a lot of team coverage, a lot of spying, a lot of working with different technologies. I had great views when I was living there. Then I did my fellowship for spine at the Rothman Institute in Philly. That's kind of where my uh, appreciation of different technologies and robotic technology really increased at that point. Um, my views quickly changed to a bunch of snowy, cold, dreary days. And now I'm in Dallas. Have My family obviously is there too. So my views now consist of mostly kids and kind of doing little pizza parties in our backyard. So technology is a fresh surgeon is probably the way I like to address this. You know, I'm not trying to tell you the advantages necessarily of robotics or augmented reality or things like that. I'm just trying to really hone in on in your first couple of years, kind of things to work on and things to think about with technology. So technology is great. And I sometimes jokingly say spine surgery is easy unless, and those are when everything works out perfect, when you know what the right indications were, and that's why you did your uh, surgery. And when you have a backup plan in place, you know, in fellowship, it was easy when you have tra someone training you, but I like this slide here. When you get your first thing out, all of a sudden you're by yourself, you're kind of pilot jumped out of the plane and it's all you. So I'm not really going to talk about implant gimmicks or technology from that standpoint. I'm going to talk about telemedicine. That's a technology that's obviously not going away. It's only going to get bigger and younger surgeons, the ones that kind of grew up with telemedicine in a way in terms of uh, kind of Skype, Zoom, um, uh, iMessenger, all those things. It's kind of, this is our backyard. We should take care of this. Approaches, OLIF, prone laterals. These are things to talk about in your first couple of years. We'll talk about robotics. I'm not arguing whether robots are better or not, but I'm going to talk about the advantages of them from a patient standpoint in terms of what they perceive and then navigation under the same argument. So again, don't let your reps kind of indicate which approaches you're doing when you're kind of coming out, all the reps and device makers who are important and have their role are going to be kind of pushing that man, this prone lateral is the best. You got to do this. Or man, you got to tell your hospital to get a robot right now because the guy down the street's going to get it. You know, a lot of that's a lot of noise. You just need to know that coming out. Some of the things I'm not going to be talking about in terms of technology, we're not talking about uh, using new high-tech devices as kind of the future. That's not really what this argument is for or against. I'm just kind of pointing out some of the more newer spine gimmicky things. And I would say in your first couple of years, I wouldn't be focusing too much on things such as this, interspinous devices, the top system, you know, I'm not arguing whether or Game changers, great things or awful things. I would just kind of stick with only very traditional things in your first couple of years. So sticking with telemedicine, you know, what COVID did is it made everyone more comfortable virtual meetings. Having to do like a webinar or Zoom or even this is something that didn't really come to full fruition until, until uh, COVID. It normalized the use of virtual appointments. When people, if you would have told me it's a patient three years ago, oh, your doctor's going to see if you're telemedicine, they would have hated that. But nowadays they love it. They see that there's total advantages of this, both from less missing time at work and just more access to your doctor. Telemedicine is not going away. The thing that I just want to highlight here is there's great publications out there. I'm going to highlight a couple of this one's by Dr. Qureshi and um, Global Spine Journal. It really talks about how even over the phone or over the screen, you can do a strength exam. You can test for myelopathy. These are things that you don't have to be in the office to do. Of course, obviously you want to do these things before you ever do a surgery. They really kind of honed in on this. Different ways to test the iliopsoas, quads, tip ant. You know, you're not going to be able to test out of five but you can get a pretty good idea of their strength, at least, you know, one to three. Same thing with Babinski. They say that obviously it's not something to do with telemedicine, but other things such as uh, straight leg raise, there's no one kind of the opening, closing your hand. Um, great things to kind of do. Another great paper by one of my friends, Alex Satin, who I know knows John and the rest of the team very well. Him and uh, Dr. Lieberman had a great, great, great paper um, out of TBI that talked about um, 
ways you incorporate telemedicine to your practice. So again, just because you grew up with talking to people online doesn't necessarily mean you know how to do telemedicine from the spine standpoint. These are some great papers that really highlight that and are worth spending some time looking at. In terms of surgical approaches, you know, when we talk about technology, yes, we're talking about robots and hardware, but surgical approaches are also technically a new technology. So I'm going to go over a couple things that in your first few years, you definitely need to think about. So I am in favor of OLIFs. I am in favor of perk screws. Don't get me wrong, but hear me out when I talk about this. So OLIFs, you know, there's a dangerous vascular risk when you're doing these solo, unless you have an access surgeon doing them with you, but that kind of maybe defeats the purpose of doing the OLIF is you don't have to rely on the access surgeon. You don't have to split all the stuff. That's Okay, part of the argument. So then if you're doing the OLIF, are you in this single position? Okay, not wrong to do in your first couple of years out. But then if you're doing single position, are you doing these perk screws? Okay, so if you're doing perk screws, then are you doing indirect decompression in addition to OLIF? Because if you're not, then why not just do an A-lift and then open up in the back or A-lift if you're going to flip anyway, then you're going to be doing perk screws in the back. So unless you're in a single position with the OLIF, it doesn't really 100% make sense um, in those first couple of years. Same with the prone lateral. You know, is this something you can just go to a course and just start doing? debatable different ways on that. But if you didn't do any of these in residency or fellowship, it really is kind of important to kind of do these with someone else. So there's nothing wrong with finding maybe another um, physician in town or spine surgeon in town that's doing these prone laterals and just go do a couple of cases with them. Just tell them you'll be an assistant. You won't be a co-surgeon. Uh, kind of gives you a little more roadmap, a little more confidence when you're doing something like a prone lateral on your own. Um, then have a backup plan in pace. If you're doing a prone lateral and things aren't going perfect, have the other stuff in the room so that you can then flip to maybe either a regular lateral or you can open up all posterior and do everything from the everything from the back. And then also if you're doing prolateral, is that assuming that you're doing um, indirect decompression? If you are doing indirect decompression, you're doing perk screws, then you really gotta know the indications. You can't just be going out there, placing perk screws and just thinking the patient's gonna get better because you fused them. You need to know if you're doing an inner body, what approach to the inner body. I think the key thing is just really making sure you have good outcomes and just knowing the indications, which is something that's stressed. But if you're using new technology, you gotta know why you're supposed to be using it. The other thing I want to harp on is everyone is watching. You know, when people say that all the time, I'm sure you heard that all the time. Uh, but really, one of the things that people don't ever see is how your patients look either clinically, which is only some of your staff, and then the x rays. So take a lot of x rays early on. That's something that I've learned. We, I went to a fellowship where we didn't, you know, they stress, oh, no, the anatomy, you don't need a lot of x rays. Like that sounds cool and makes you think you're cool. But if you have wonky looking screws or your cage isn't perfectly centered, you know, that's worth spending a little extra time on the first couple of years just because it makes you look slick and no one knows how many x-rays you take. So the next thing we'll talk about is robotic navigation. And these pictures are all uh, total hip and total knee images. And I'm gonna tell you why I'm saying that. So to be real, I always argue that total hip arthroplasty, total knee arthroplasty has a huge advantage of us in terms of robotics and the marketing aspect of it. I don't like those surgeries, I don't do those surgeries, but I have people all the time ask me about robotic knee replacements, robotic hip replacements. That's the thing, if I was gonna get one these days, I would want a robot doing it or assisting, you know, the recon patients know these things. They want the doctors that do these things. And this is just a marketing aspect. Spine shouldn't be any different. We're always way behind the total joint arthroplasty literature and the, their bell curve. They just replicate the same two surgeries over and over, as we jokingly say. They know what they're doing. This will be the future. Patients will want robotic spine surgery, at least uh, ability for your surgeon to be part of it. Just for the marketing aspect of it, this is something I made just while watching TV with my wife, just a little 15 second clip and it just gets shared by people. People love it. It looks like technology. It looks cool. It just shows that, you know, robots helping you do spine surgery. People just kind of like seeing an inside look into the OR. And if you're just doing, you know, basic tubular decompressions, which is great, that's not going to make for kind of good TV, as I say, or good marketing TV. And again, my argument with this and the marketing aspect of it, it's not necessarily I'm marketing this directly to patients. I don't anticipate any patient or hopefully not ever find me on you know instagram facebook or linkedin this is more my audience is my pcps chiropractors friends i've made in my local area people i grew up with community leaders that's one way you should be focusing on technology and robotics is a way that you can do that same argument here this is just another um kind of friend of mine i met he practices outside of denver at the sky ridge medical center and he's the same thing made a great video about how to use robotics in the or and this is just a really popular video it just kind of shows people how to do it and when patients see something like this they think wow this person has a lot of speed a lot of safety a lot of perfection again this is probably times five speed so a little fake news on that aspect but again robotic navigation implies these things implies that the surgeon is slick and uses the newest technology and whether true or not it's a thing that from a marketing standpoint, it's kind of important to show other providers in the area, not necessarily your patients, but other providers in the area that are using the most high-tech things. 
So a couple of pearls for those kind of doing their first few navigation page, uh, cases. Start with only one level fusion. Don't try to do a couple of levels in your first. I would start with an open case. Yes, kind of the point of navigation is doing percutaneous. So I know that defeats the purpose, but really it's nice to be able to see those landmarks when the robot or your nav is kind of putting something down to be able to look at stuff. I wouldn't start with the T-lift procedure because obviously you're taking off half the set or both set on one side. It kind of removes some of your posterior landmarks. <clears throat> and then I'd also recommend pacing the screws prior to your lamy. Some people do that anyway, if you're doing a lamy, of course. But this is again, just more landmarks and more less risk of dropping something in the canal, which is an issue. In terms of um, getting an interop CT or a CT pre-op, um, just kind of my experience with this, because we did a ton of pre-op CTs and fellowship, and I do almost exclusively interop CTs. One of the ways you can argue this is if you do an O-arm spin in the OR, there's a lot less fuss factor. You don't need a perfect X-ray tech shooting those floors, kind of navigate and line up everything. So let's start with the case where you're utilizing the O-arm. It's just a lot less stress in the in the case. Pre-op CTs are great. Um, I argue not to use these if you're doing inner bodies before, although I know axial cuts, it's totally different. So I'm not arguing that, but if you're doing a lot of inner bodies, doing a pre-op CT, I argue changes the um, anatomy. So I just want to mess with that beforehand. Uh, one of the key things I know is um, really hot these days for all surgical fields is augmented reality. In the top left of this screen, you know, a Time article came out says AR was the, um, I guess I cut some of it off, but it was the technology advancement of 2021. To me, I'm a little like, okay, that's a little aggressive to say this is like the best thing about advancement of spine surgery in 2021 is augmented reality. Like, okay, fine. I even have like a little PubMed thing showing the searches. That's 2020. Um, and so some of those are still coming out, but you can see it's not just a hot topic. A lot of pubs are coming out. Is this a newer technology? It has been around for a while. Is it safer? Is it faster? Are you better with it? You know, those are personal questions that you'll have to ask other providers uh, in terms of incorporating into your practice. I do think there could be a role and might be a role for augmented reality in the future, but kind of in your first, just starting out again, stick with what you know, stick with what you feel good at. Um, again, I don't think it's a game changer. I think it's just another great tool. The way I jokingly argue is I focus on the marketing aspect of it. If you're doing augmented reality spine surgery, that sounds pretty cool. It sounds like you're really kind of next level, next cutting edge stuff. And so those would be some of the ways kind of, if you want to incorporate some of this technology, you should do it in the first couple of years. Uh, just as a side note, in terms of navigation, I used to, this is a picture from fellowship. Navigation fellowship was just a cluster. The staff hated it. When everybody starts bringing the arm, everyone threw up their arms and it was like the worst thing you could have done in the world. You're like, everyone hated you. But in practice, I noticed you bring the arm to check your screws. Everyone loves it. It's, uh, you know, the, the facility and the people doing it are compensated. Uh, but they're very fast when they do it. They're professionals up that they're not in training, but everyone's just very, very fast on it. And especially, you know, during your boards, as I mentioned before, kind of getting perfect images is a really, really key aspect. No one's going to know necessarily how long the case took you to do, but everyone's going to be seeing your x-ray. So that's an important thing also. Um, you know, why are we even talking about navigation, you know, or is technology our friends? Does it matter? You know, open fluoroscopic techniques are the foundations of spine surgery. Don't be fooled. Technology is a way to enhance our decision making. It doesn't replace our open skills. So still obviously be very comfortable with open uh, technologies when doing this. Uh, so the kind of key points in this slide I made, how you feel in your first year of practice, you might feel like you're an astronaut out there, you're a child just trying to figure out everything. You're all by yourself, kind of out there in the atmosphere, um, in outer space. But to patients, how you look, we were just talking about this beforehand. You look like a baby. You got to just come in there with confidence. You got to let them know that you are extremely well trained. You know what you're doing and kind of let them know. Telemedicine is a great way to connect with patients that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. It's only going to get more prevalent. It's only going to um, get to be a bigger deal and more platforms are going to come out to support it. Um, you know, technology can make a surgeon safer, but you should also look at the marketing aspects of it. At the end of the day, we are selling cars. We are selling a product and that's our surgery and that's our advice. Um, and be safe and ask for help. If you have any uh, questions, I have my uh, social media contacts there, my office, and if anyone reached out to me, I'd obviously give you my cell phone. I'm just I'm going to blast it out to the entire world just so it doesn't get picked up some spam marketing, but happy to talk to anyone at any time about any other things.